Thank you. So welcome everybody, um, and thanks for taking the time to join us. Um, my name is Tom Skellant, and I'm a senior pharmacy executive at Oracle Health and a pharmacist by background. I'm joined by two colleagues who I'll introduce in a moment. And today we're going to be talking about maximizing EPR investment to effectively advance healthcare. As most of you will know, uh, about a year ago, Cerna were acquired by Oracle and became Oracle Health. We believe that technology must play a greater role in solving critical health and well-being challenges impacting people around the world. With the addition of Cerna to Oracle Health's portfolio, we will advance how health happens by providing secure and reliable solutions that deliver better health insights and people-centric experiences. So implementing EPR is the first step, but what comes next? We'll be looking at which factors need to be considered to ensure you are maximizing your investment. From a benefits realization perspective, we know that EPRs increase patient safety, increase service efficiency, and reduce paper. But we also aim to enhance the care experience and care team well-being, as well as advancing health equity, reducing costs, and improving population health. A lot of this comes from recognizing the importance of education and adoption. So here at Oracle Health, we've developed the Adoption Leadership Academy. This is a 12 month program that provides clinical and operational leaders with the knowledge to drive IT enabled transformational change from within the trust. It helps identify and optimize projects that based on data from the EPR can solve challenges across the organization. We recognize that clinicians are trained to be clinicians, but crucially don't often get trained in project management or change management when they're faced with these roles. The Academy invests in staff to provide development opportunities and improve satisfaction, allowing them to gain a deeper knowledge and application of data tools and optimization methods and optimize adoption of technology to improve end user pain points. With that being said, I'd like to introduce my guests today so firstly, I'm going to hand over to Laura to provide an overview of the work that Milton Keynes are doing on their EPR. Laura, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what's happening at Milton Keynes. Thanks very much, Tom, and uh, very exciting to be here and hi, Neil, as well. Um, so uh, my name is Laura Crump. I'm the Chief Nursing Information Officer or CNIO here at Milton Keynes University Hospital based in uh, Buckinghamshire. We, for a bit of background about myself, I... Um, I'm a nurse by background and I'm very proud to be a nurse by background and that enables me to act as a bridge between our clinical teams and our information technology both in terms of a digital technical sense um, and also of anything that we are rolling out um, technology wise. We went live with CERNA Millennium and I will just pause to say I apologize in advance we call CERNA Millennium eCare at Milne Keynes so if I slip into saying eCare You'll know what I mean when I when I instead of say Cerner Millennium. So we went live with that in 2018 uh, for inpatient ED functionality, including um, patient um, medication, so our EPMA functionality as well. And we didn't include peds and uh, theatres in that journey or ICU uh, at that time as well. We did have a, a go live planned for 2021, uh, sorry, 2020 for those. Uh, fortunately, there was a small um, dilemma of a pandemic that kind of got in the way of that. So we actually went live in 2021 with our PEDS, um, ICU and theatres offering, and that's been uh, very successful. And it's been a journey, I have to say. I'm very fortunate in my role, not only because I'm able to act, as I said, the bridge or the translator between IT and clinical and clinical to IT. Also, because when I first started in Milton Keynes in 2017, we were six, seven months away from that Big Bang Go Live. And I actually did that Big Bang Go Live as a clinician. So I was a senior sister of our day surgery unit here, and I've experienced it on both sides. I have been able to use the system to care for patients and document within their record and I've also experienced and been involved with um, go lives from a technical technological side so that's been really exciting and I'm very fortunate and it enables me to have that conversation and that link um, those rapports with with all of our clinical members of staff and although I am a nurse I also cover our midwifery colleagues AHP colleagues healthcare assistants and doctors as well because they all like to talk to me which is really exciting I really like to talk to lots of different people and support them through the journey 
And it is a journey, I have to say. Um, as you said, uh, Tom, implementation is just the beginning. And I feel like we're five and a half years down the line and we're still trying to figure out some of those workflows and some of that implementation. So other than the go live for uh, theatres, PEDS and um, ICU in 2021, this year we have been looking at, um, well, we have implemented uh, mobile devices for our nurses and midwives to be able to safely administer medications. We, had a, we do have an EPMA programme which enables scanning of wristbands and medication as part of those workflows, which in, increases the safety elements of meds admin. And the handheld devices further increases that safety because I'm able to do a slightly improved or different workflow um, with a handheld device and not break the loop, as it were, when I'm um, uh, administering medications using a, a workstation on where or WOW, as, as we call them. Um, we, so we went live with that back in um, July this year. And just prior to that, in May this year, we also went live with capacity management, which is uh, a bed flow um, application, which enables... Uh, slightly smoother transition and it means our bed managers and site managers don't quite have to run around the site as they as they did before. Uh, as you intimated we've also been looking at the um, Digital Academy and we're really excited to begin on that journey and I know there are some trusts that have already uh, gone through that, there's a couple that are on their second and third cohorts of staff and we're really looking forward to be able to invest a bit more in some of our, our Milton Keynes staff get a deeper knowledge of, of data and applications and also just bring those back into the journey. So we had a lot of staff that were heavily involved, clinical staff that is heavily involved right at the very beginning for that, that build, that implementation, and then that big bang go live. But now, not that we've left them by the wayside at all, we are always involving our clinicians in all the decisions that we're making in terms of any, any new projects or any applications that we're buying, but just to get a better insight onto some specific clinicians and in, individuals' insights uh, to particular problems that they might be having, or if there's been updated guidance from NICE, for example, it's it's easier then to get them on board and to be able to like bring those on um, that journey with us so that they can be clinical leaders for our, um, our ongoing projects um, in the future. So not just for the, for the Digital Academy as well. We've had quite an organic process so far through, through our um, use of uh, what we call super users. So we had those four, four go live and we utilised those for, to great effect. They were really, really useful. They were the first point of call on the wards um, and in ED for our clinical members of staff. If they had a problem, first port of call, give a super user a shout and see if they can help you. And if not, there's an escalation process. We haven't really encouraged the use of those as much because we haven't done any more significant go-lives that were quite like that. We um, we did have a, a couple more within our Catman rollout, but we... Um, I believe we need to increase our use of super users going forward. And I know certainly our chief nurse is heavily on board with that. And having on most wards in other places that I've worked, they've had champions for tissue viability or falls risks. Um, so actually we would like to do the same thing for eCare or Cerner Millennium so that we can really drive forward some of those improvements, some of those changes, remind people of how best to do something or how efficiently to do something and just really get voices and opinions. So, you know, this, eCare, Cerner Millennium, any EPR is a tool that should be used for us to document the care that we're delivering and to provide some of that uh, clinical decision support. I suppose with the, um, the super users that you had before, that big cohort, that knowledge is still remained within the wards, so yep. that can still be used and that's something you can fall back on. Is there yeah, an intention to do that? Yeah, definitely. And actually, you want to, we, we, you'll always get people that are really enthusiastic about something and then people that are not quite so enthusiastic about something. We want to enable those people that are really enthusiastic and know how to use the system really, really well to support those and bring them all. So we're all facing the same way on the bus um, to, to deliver the care that we need to deliver to a safe um, level and to be a high quality. Yeah, lovely. Thanks, Laura. Um, so with that, thanks for telling us a little bit about what's happening at Milton Keynes. Um, I'll pass over to Neil, who's from Caldersdale Huddersfield Foundation Trust to tell us a little bit about what's happening there. Yeah, so, so hi guys, uh, my name's Neil Staniforth. Um, I work for Colin and Postfield Foundation Trust and also the Health Informatics Service also. Um, I'm probably the other side to the coin to Laura, this one. I'm the IT person who tries to translate to clinical people and vice versa back again. 
Um, from an experience perspective, I've worked in the IT for 12 and a bit years now, uh, and I had a three-year stint in there when I reported into the Kuwait Search of T, for example, um, to look at operationalizing IT and digital and to steer away from probably calling it IT and the purest firm and saying it's really digital, um, working really closely with the CNIO and the CCIO um, and the CDIO in there as well, really creating a digital health team within that senior structure uh, within CHFT. We went live with CERN and Millennium um, back in 2017, where we were one of the first in country to do a double domain. So for example, we had Collardale and Huddersfield Foundation Trust, but we also had Bradford Teaching Hospitals that joined us on that domain. We went live in the May and they followed in the September. Um, both trusts approached to do a big bang. So we went live with ED, with inpatients, with outpatients, um, capacity management and all those different bits. We stayed away from maternity and surgery um, and Bradford and the way the domain is set up, we were not stifling either organization. So for example, Bradford Teaching Hospitals is just currently taking on, uh, they've taken maternity on last year and they're also taking on TAC. Um, so that's the it is critical care side. They'll be doing that uh, next September as well. Um, and also we'll be taking Airedale into the domain as well. So that'll be three separate organizations on one domain. Um, from a CHFT perspective, we've been live with it for six years, it'll be seven years in May. Um, very much so. We've always strived to attempt to get the best out of the data. We've always had a really strong business information team and we've always looked at let's let the data help us decide what we should do, not lead us to do what we do. Um, we've always considered ourselves to be data rich and we'd, that's getting ourselves to being data intelligent with it as well, I think. And I think part of what we've been doing over at CHFT now is that looking at our quality priorities, looking at the nursing doctation, documentation, but also looking at the placement we've done, digital placements. Um, that's been a really, really useful opportunity for nurses to get some of that exposure in there. So this year we've done in March, we had a week placement with three student nurses, with three speech and language therapy students, looking at different areas across the trust from a digital perspective. So really giving junior members of staff really early on in their careers that exposure to look at it and go actually I'm, I'm really interested in that digital side um, and it's not to say it's a, a taboo topic anymore it's very much so knitted and weaved into everything that we do and it becomes more apparent as you start to speak to people like Laura at Milton Keynes is the CNIO role it doesn't have to be a nurse it could be a midwife it could be an HP it could be an OT it's to broaden that out but to give those people that exposure so it's not something they find later in their careers it's something that they find earlier um off the back of that, we've done another second cohort in November, which again was a two-week placement with two student nurses, two OTs, um, and doing those bits has been really good, following with a QI project at the end of it. And um, what's the feedback been on that from the students? Have, have, is that something they've enjoyed? Is that something they've found yeah, unique? They've absolutely enjoyed it. It's some we bring them in for a couple of day induction at the start of that. They go through that process. We're in our second cohort now. Um that's always a testament to whether it's been successful, whether we can get a second cohort to go through that. They've really enjoyed doing it and they've got a lot out of it. I think a lot of people, you don't get an opportunity to spend a day with a, a clinical site commander, for example, when you're a student nurse uh, as often, especially to look at the digital elements of that. That's what that placement allows them to do. And it allows them to look at those digital areas. It's been really well adhered um, and done. Um, yeah, I think it'll be one that we continue to do for many years. It'll evolve as it goes, as digital does, but I think it, the principles will be the same about getting those people to look at the what the art, the possible is, what the, a nurse can do now, and it's very limitless. Agreed. Thanks, Neil. Um, Laura, you, you kind of mentioned earlier um, that this is a journey, um, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. So how have you found bringing a set of, of users on a journey um, to, to develop your EPR? Well, it's been, a, I suppose, an interesting process. And although there's um, EPRs are now prevalent throughout well, lots of the world, actually, you know, um, Cerno is, well, Oracle Health is based in the US, but there is a, a UK flavour as such, which fits our NHS um, policies and uh, requirements and workflows a, a, a bit better. Um, it's also used in Australia and um, the UAE as well. So I think they... As um, Neil alluded to just now, that actually our EPR should work for us. I shouldn't have to change all my workflows to bend my back to to make sure I can do the right thing in the in the documentation. I should be able to the the, the best solution should be the easiest one. The easiest solution should be the correct one, right? So 
it's definitely been a, a journey and making sure that uh, new staff that we have are trained appropriately is really important, but also the people that we have trained back in 2018, the beginning of that is really important to, to keep those on the journey with us so that we're able to um, deliver the best care and document that care. It's It's been interesting, I have to say, having done both both roles it's it's varied and the experience is is different depending on who you talk to and what kind of role they're in and how long they've been in the organization so I, I don't think it's something that we've we've quite got right yet and I, I don't know if anybody if anybody has yet and if they have I'd really like to talk to them um but I think I think it's going to be an ongoing process and pr providing training to that number of staff initially was a huge undertaking and then trying to make sure that if there's any updates or any improvements or any projects that we're now doing that the, the people who need to be aware of those are aware of them and are involved in that build journey as well is also really important and we do try we spend a lot of time trying to engage with our clinical members of staff at, at all levels to make sure that they know what's coming that they are able to be involved and that they can help with the build so they know their workflows they they learn those clinical elements when they're both in training and when they're on the job itself. So they know those the best and we need to learn from them um, so that we can provide the, be the best solution for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned before, the, the Oracle Health Adoption Leadership Academy um, mm. aims to address clinical adoption um, and is open to all Oracle Health customers. So Royal Bar should have just, like you said, put in their third cohort through at the moment. And you are looking to do your first. Were there any particular reasons, Laura, why you thought this was a, a good thing or something you wanted to do? Well, I think it's about trying to reinvest or give back to some of the clinical teams that have oh, that still work really hard. You know, the NHS is a hard place to work. I say a hard place to work. It's a fun place to work, but it's really tough because we're people looking after people, trying to do the best that we can. And so it's it's enabling us to give back to the workforce, but also gain a deeper insight into some of the challenges that they might be facing and to hone down on particular workflows or things that do need improvement. Also aiming to optimize some of that adoption piece so that we're able to see right so you're key in this you you have a, a leadership voice within this organization because you are xyz and it's and it's open to everybody we're, we're not going to put any constraints on that anybody can apply for that um uh, the academy if they would if they wish to um and they aim to have a a project at the end of it so like almost like a small quality improvement project where they can um they can see the benefit of, of their work that they're doing and actually then have a real impact um both in care delivery and in the in the epr solution that's offered Lovely, thanks for um, Neil, yours is, is quite a unique role uh, in that it combines operations into IT. What value have, have you and the, the organisation found in having someone with operations experience that close to the EPR? I think this benefit, I'd probably be remiss to say it hasn't really. I think it does help having somebody sat next to a really strong CNIO and CCIO knowing the limitations of EPR and there is limitations and sometimes it's, it's there's a good reason why a system shouldn't let you do certain things um, it's good to have someone there that can understand the digital implications of this but also understand from a clinical and a nursing and an operational perspective the why that the those groups of staff want to do the things they want to do um, nobody rocks up to do a bad job we all rock up to do a job and sometimes getting everybody to that finishing goal can mean a very higgledy piggledy line it's never that straight line from a project plan perspective so i think it benefits because it it, it definitely helps and it also works back the other way i'll say it translates a lot of the time so from an operational perspective understanding thing and trying to make our digital and it people say no you can't do certain things at a certain time you can't do you can't change that as well it, it does feed back both ways as well um, and it, it it benefits from that, I think, the most. It's that two-way conversation, but with an understanding of why. Um, because often or not, it's just a case of, in other organisations, when I spoke to them, it's a case of we, they don't have that uh, interface between. So sometimes it's very much in isolation. One is saying one and one is saying another. Or I think it, it helps that culture um, to be very, IT's here, nursing's there, but it's the digital bit which brings us all into one umbrella and we're doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Laura talked a little bit about uh, bringing people on a journey with her, and I know that Calderdale have been have been really good uh, in taking what clinicians and end users have said um, and translating that at a board level. Involvement in that, and how's that how's that been for you? Yeah, I think it was. I think one of the key bits for us, if we went back to like the the reason why as well, uh, Tommy, we were really lucky that from a 
CHFT perspective, the CDIO SAS sits in those exact roles as that name of the table uh, straight from the off. Um, we've had a CNIO since before EPR as well, um, which was really beneficial and a strong CCIO as well, all in place doing a tactical program before we even embarked on looking at EPR, um, nevertheless, which one we'd go for. Um, so I think that's been massively helpful um, to get there with it. I think some of the stuff we've been doing from an optimization perspective, I think we've always got to look at the the why we're doing it. And optimization is something that you start an EPR, you aim for that go live day, and it's you get to there and think, right, so then a case of you'll you'll stabilize and you'll optimize. Um optimization will never be finished. It's it's like the Golden Gate Bridge or the fifth, but you never finish. You just get to the end of it and you go, either nice guidance has changed or our practices have now changed and evolved. We've got to go back to the beginning and start. And that's not a bad thing. Going back and challenging ourselves on the why for six years on is not a bad thing. It's actually really healthy. And it's a culture that we really support. We'll quite happily go back and challenge decisions that were made in a snapshot in time. Um, and I think that's where the team that I sit in really helps put that challenge in, but also brings the solutions. It's not just about constantly challenging. It's about saying, well, here are our solutions. What do we want to do as a as a group and an organization? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of that has to do with the data. Um, so is is data something that so Neil Fairs, you know, data something that's so important, but is, is data something that you've you've looked at within the trust to try and make change effective? Yeah, absolutely. I think we'd and I referenced earlier on that from a warehouse perspective, we've done loads and loads with our warehouse. Um, the data part of that is something that we've really used to inform where we should look. So, for example, we know that from a quality priorities perspective from CHFT, we've used that data uh, to say that actually some bits haven't been as accurate as they could be. Um, so what we've done is we've re-looked at all of our nursing documentation. In looking at that nursing documentation, the overall idea is to really try and reduce the burden, um, but then also keep in that whole individual-centered patient care side of it. Um that would work. It was a nine month piece of work to look at our nursing documentation. Um, so it's not a small undertaking, but the output, having those engagement sessions with all the different groups of nurses and different disciplines in there, a massive change. Um, that's ultimately helped our data to be better. If our data is better, our decisions moving forward will be better. Um, getting people to do things in the right way will always be one of the fundamental challenges of any digital system. Um, from a purely IT perspective, the best group of people we can find to find a workaround uh, is nursing staff and clinical staff because that's what they've done. They're made, they may build that way to try and find workarounds and different ways of doing things. And it isn't a bad thing because actually a workaround can very easily become, well, if that's the quicker way, if we can make it work from a digital perspective, if we can get that data out, do we tear that? Do we actually change the status quo and say that's what we have and maybe we should be doing it? Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I have to say, we're, we're, we're like water. We follow the path of least resistance. I think all clinicians <laughs> are like that. We're, we like to try and find a, a way to do things. So I like to sometimes give my clinical members of staff access to one of our test domains, so not with real patient data, and say, right, break the thing that I've just made or the workflow that we've just designed. Tell me what's wrong with it. Tell me what could be better. What, why have we got five steps when there should be one? How many clicks is that? And as, yeah. you, as you say, Neil, documentation is real and present and I think it's even more prevalent with digital systems because there's lots of different ways of doing the same thing and if staff don't understand I suppose the what's in it for them as well as the why in order to see the benefit of why they had to document a particular thing in a particular way in a particular place at a particular time because of if it's not documented it's not done um, then yeah I think we we run the risk of um giving our staff too much to do in a short period of time when they're already overstretched trying to deliver the best care that they possibly can. And I do think one thing from a CHFT perspective that we've really tried to do is we've tried to make people understand that whole patient journey. Um, it's really easy. And if it's like when you start a journey, if you do something wrong at the very beginning, it's like building a skyscraper, isn't it? If you do something wrong at the bottom, by the time you get to the top, it's a massive problem. If you put the wrong problem in, if you do the wrong encounter type, if you do something like that, it's, it's really easy. It's getting a group of people from all the different disciplines to look back at the end product and go, the reason why it's off is because we did this bit wrong here. Um, it's that whole bit. And we've really tried to get people to stand back and look at that to understand that every person's part is just as important. But if we do it differently, then this is what's going to be the impact to the other people. And that's a really hard thing to do when it's taken us a long time to get there with it. Definitely. I and mean, also just to add to that, being able to 
take a step back from the thing that you've built that you potentially are really proud of to have some constructive criticism where someone says actually that's not how that worked at all or I wasn't there for that conversation or that's not the workflow for that and and then being able to unbuild what you've done and have to rebuild it in a different way so being a bit humble about the solution I think is quite important especially from an IT perspective I've, I've definitely become more humble I suppose as, as my role has gone on because I don't know everything I don't know all these workflows I don't know exactly how the midwives look after patients on our maternity wards because I'm not a midwife I'm a nurse and I won't pretend to know all of those workflows but I will happily eat up all of the information and all the workflows that they're giving me so that we can provide a better solution for them to deliver that care. And I think you'd both agree that that's why it's so critical to have clinicians on uh, within these projects. Um, mm -hmm. But like I said earlier, that it's the change in the and the uh, project management that maybe they that they don't always get. So Laura, uh, talking about potentially your embarkation onto the academy, do you mm -hmm. have any um, particular uh, things that you're looking forward to putting into action afterwards that after you've done the academy? Oh, that's a question. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to put any constraints on that. I think it depends on the individuals that are in the first cohort and what they come up with. I, I don't want to say that's a really ambiguous answer, isn't it? I don't want to say here's what we're going to achieve by doing this, because, I mean, the world's our oyster, right? I can I can I can do do what we want. I, it's, it depends on on the individuals that, that apply and what what quips they decide to do. Yeah. Very good. And Neil, um, what about you? Um, we you've talked a little bit about, um, or both of you actually, we talked a little bit about reducing the burden of, of documentation. But how do we manage to to reduce that by keeping up the um, individual centred care? Go, well, Laura, if you want to take that one first. <laughs> um, well, so it's about understanding the individuals that's that's involved as soon as we as soon as you go live with something digital specifically you inevitably have a device or some technology that you're putting in front of a clinician and trying to figure out how to work that whilst also looking after your patient so ideally i would like the clinicians the nurses midwives doctors ahps everybody when i say clinicians i mean all of those people I'm not, i don't have to list everybody all the time um <laughs> we've put a, a workstation on wheels which has got a 27 inch monitor on it in our workspaces now they're in our clinical areas and if you put that as a barrier between you and your patient you have a barrier between you and your patient so actually we need to come out from behind the workstation yeah. on wheels deliver the care document that at the same time ideally the, the the documentation should be contemporaneous but if i would much rather people deliver the care that they need to deliver and then document later than try and do both at the same time that's quite difficult with things like medications workflows um, but now we've got handheld devices for our nurses and midwives. They're able to take that device, which is the size of your mobile phone. It's quite small, but offers uh, uh, an improved workflow for especially some of our more complicated medications and our intravenous medications. So controlled drugs and IV medications actually have a, a better work workflow with the handheld devices that we've implemented. Neil, anything to add there? Not really. I think I couldn't say it probably better than Laura has, to be fair. Um, <laughs> No. Can you no, tell us a little bit about the maybe the change facilitators that you have in Caldwell? Yeah, I think that's the bit where we've done something. We've tried previously, and I know Laura's referenced what Milton Keynes has managed to do in regards to, and I'm going to call them the wrong name. Now, we ultimately, before we went live, we wanted to have some digital champions on our wards to do exactly the same thing as what you've described. Um, we've never really got them off the ground. So what we started at the start of the this financial year was we got five change facilitators in um, reporting into our CNIO, Louise Croxall, um, and they are focusing on different areas. That team is made up of registered nurses. We have somebody who used to work in pathology. We've got somebody who used to work in a point of care testing team. We've got somebody who used to work in project management in there. So there's a really diverse group of people with a really different set of skills, and they've been really instrumental now around getting on the elbow of nurses and doctors and all the different clinical bodies that we've got and actually getting into the wards and saying, I'm not going to pull you out for half a day's training to teach you how to do this different bit. I'm going to do a really small bite-sized bit of learning with you. Say, if we do this, focus on this for a month, this will get better. There'll be a tangible outcome for this. Um, we are really, really happy with how our change sales have got out there and really got their sleeves rolled up and started to make those projects move forward. But again, it's another voice that comes back into our projects and, 
most of our projects are clinically led at CHFT. They're then digitally delivered, but they're clinically led. So our CNA, our CCIOs, our DDs and our CDs, they drive those. Um, we're there to support them, keep them honest and do that. Similarly, those change facilitators that we have in the room, they are there as SMEs in that room. Um, and then they'll be on there for when we're taking things live. They'll be there for when we're trying to fix things. They're there throughout the whole part of it. Um, they're really instrumental and it's not to confuse change with training um I am, i'm always very clear on this from a training perspective that is somebody that will teach you how to do something change is saying this is how you used to do it and this is how you're going to do it now in your environment and we say this is the rationale to why um it's changing the practice and it's been able to have that conversation with people to make them understand and get them to stand back and look at the whole picture and that's i think the slight difference but from a change perspective i think we finally got where we want to be we'll always take more i think you can probably never have enough of them um, absolutely yeah. Laura, think, did you... yeah sorry i think i think also data play, plays a big part in that as well and i know neil you talked about data and it's not something that i'm used to talking about as a clinician is data i used to if i ever wanted to do an audit on something before i used to have to pull notes from medical records and then spend however long sifting through medical records deciphering everybody's handwriting including mine and then trying to get some data out of that with some tangible end results and that took me a long time and by by the time I'd finished that process the goals had changed or the metrics had changed whereas now we've got an EPR and I've got five and a half years worth of data I mean that's not an insignificant amount of data it's huge really? we spend a lot of time I spent a lot of time in IT talking to our data warehouse team and my information colleagues about the data that we can pull from the system and then how we can deliver that back to our clinicians to in, enforce or change or improve practice I've actually got um, an example actually if you'd like of how yeah. data has improved our practice or a couple Absolutely. of things actually the, the first is about our um, visual infusion phlebitis scores which is an assessment on if you have a cannula inserted or a, one of the little plastic tubes that we use to deliver intravenous medications that wasn't particularly well documented um, but one of our matrons took the data and ran with that and every morning we have a, a huddle where we talk about um, the site and how it's looking and uh, every ward has a has a voice within that and she mentioned every day the the, the percentage of the the score that was documented because we can do we can display that data and there has been a significant increase we're now at 90 percent than we were significantly lower than that um of, of that being actually documented i know that i know it's being done it's just not been documented or wasn't being documented so that's amazing um yeah that's really cool well it's really great to hear that there's there's real tangible things that that kind of show the the value of, of using the data um and having an epr so i guess that's mm -hmm. one of the things that kind of comes to maxim from maximizing investment which is obviously what we're talking about today and um, we're really only scratching the surface of that as well we, i don't think we fully appreciate what we can do with that data and how powerful it is yet and how you display that, who you give it to, what time of day you give it to people, the, the right person, do we give it to everybody? Does everybody need to have it in a graph format? Do people want it in a spreadsheet to be able to look at their own things? Yeah. It's, it, yeah, we're, we're, we're very, very early on in our journey for that. Well, not very early, but well, on the journey. I think CHFT, right, we're really lucky from our warehouse team. It's a massive team of people that we have, but we also have performance information leads. We sit within our clinical divisions as well. Um, we're using the data that we're now getting out. And as I said earlier, seven years in May, we'll have had EPR for, and the, all of the other bits that we pull in there, though, it's not, it's always going to be EPRs. I mean, that single record, isn't it? But then it's the other EPRs that we then have in trust. It's what maternity service is still using. It's those bits. We pull those together into some really innovative models. We've got predictive models now, for example, that now we've got seven years worth of data nearly from uh, FirstNet. We can say, well, actually, we know out of the 50 people in our waiting room how much of those are likely to be admitted and the presenting reason. And that's live. That's always now live. And it's that for people who haven't done that journey yet to go live with it, it's a really nice endpoint. It might be six or seven years in when you finally get to do it, but it's a really nice bit to be able to say, actually, you can see the wood for the trees sometimes, and that's just one example of one of the models. I'm thinking of last count, I think we've probably had near enough a couple of hundred models that we use um, for varying different things. Um, and that's exactly because people like Laura, people like Louise, as my CNIO, will turn around and say, oh, have we looked at this? And now we have a digital solution we can see. Whereas before, Laura would have had to go off to a medical records department somewhere and spend hours upon hours. We can get the data in in now hours and it's all done it's all there it's collated it's digestible and we can say 
but now so what? And our chief exactly is really good at saying, so we have the data, so what? Um, and it's then taking it to those groups and saying, so now we do know what we're going to do about it. Um, are we going to get the change people in there to increase the documentation type? Are we going to simplify the documentation type by what we've done with the nursing documentation for that optimization piece? It's the so what, and we're really good at now calling out and saying, yes, you can be data rich, but are we data smart? Um, so yeah. Yeah. So the thing what I'm hearing is that is to to kind of maximize your 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 money, then I guess data is is absolutely crucial um, in this part for you to for you to show the value that the, the EPR is bringing. Um, so it's about using that. So I guess the question is, is you both kind of talked, given examples there really about um, how the data has, has really helped you at this point. Is there any plans going forward to, to build on that? Is there any other things in plans that you've got from a QI perspective or anything at the moment that you may, you're thinking about using data for? Oh, hundreds actually. And I, I think often, I mean, even the safety learning events or the, uh, old data well we have radar now as a system for reporting incidents is the data system as it were we can i can pull data on that so easily for, and for every patient that was on a ward over a period of time whereas if i was doing an audit before it would be a snapshot of maybe five or six patients but i could i mean i can pull data for every patient on a ward from the beginning of us using cerna millennium back in 2018 and that's really powerful but it's also a vast amount of data and trying to find someone to sift through that and go through that to make sense of it to then say, right, well, yes, yeah, so what? What are we going to do with this now? I've got this data, but how can I improve the next thing or what, what is the next project that we can use this data for? So I don't know if there's anything specific that necessarily comes to mind immediately, but we definitely are not going to be um, decreasing our use of data now that we've got it. We're only going to be increasing that and we're, we're always getting more and more out of the system. And, and, and actually that's, down to the clinicians again yeah sometimes they'll say oh can i pull data on x oh well i haven't actually considered that before so yeah absolutely let's have a look at that let's pull that let's see what that says oh right so now we need to look at that now we need to look at the workflow for that maybe make a change here that we've just improved practice in this but in a short period of time based on the data that we can pull from the system that the clinical teams are adding to their patient's record oh, i think that's really exciting that's really cool and i think there's there's a long way to go, but we've definitely seen some improvements and some um, changes in practice based on the data that we have drawn and the, the results that we've seen from that. And it's endless, really, isn't it? The options that you've got available to you. Neil, do you want to come in there? Yeah, and I think it's, I think we're so far down the journey now is you asked the question, Tom, and I'm sat there thinking there's, there'll be 50 or 60 things we'll probably look at in the next quarter. And it wouldn't be something that's at the forefront of mind that we're doing this exceptional. It's just, it's part of day-to-day -day business now. I think that's the bit... I mean, don't be wrong, we've got, we're looking at now combining some of our GP data in with secondary care data to look at some of those, breaking down the boundaries of the four walls of a hospital and saying, right, then so if we know that there's certain comorbidities in community and we know that those groups come in, if they come into hospital, how long will they be with us for if we do interventions earlier on? But we're always looking at that. So we're, we'll do some more focus piece of work probably um, in the next few months um, as winter pressure start to high. And we said, right, then what is that cohort of patients that we know we can release beds for quicker by doing it? Um, we know that we'll start to do some of that work, but I think it's so now woven in with what we do. It's not a, it isn't something that we do as something exceptional or out of the ordinary. It's what we do every day now um, because we've got the data, because we've got such a good team behind us. We can just do it now. Yeah, lovely. So we have had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the first one I'm, I'm going to go to is Loy. I hope I've said that correct. It was about how to make the trade-off between a big bang versus a phased implementation. Now, I actually think that could be a webinar in itself. There is a lot to unpick there. Um, so I'm going to put that to you both to just give one or two reasons. Neil, you look like you're about to, to go into it, but let's kind of keep that short. And then, Loy, I can send you some some bits after the, the webinar as well that will help with that. Neil? Yeah, so I'm... And I think you probably opt to go for what you uh, what you know, really. So I'd always say there's always going to be positive benefits of doing a big bang versus like a rolling thunder. Um, I think your big bang is ultimately if you can manage to achieve that critical mass and getting all of your inpatients, your outpatients, your ED on there, it is that ultimate quick gratification because you'll take that hurdle. Everyone takes that leap together. There's almost a level of camaraderie within the organization, whereas 
I feel that when we've had previous conversations with organizations who just haven't done that, I've gone, yeah, it's been a lot slower process as rewarding, but a lot slower. I think the big bang is that everyone gets to where they need to be. And then there's a level of up learning, which happens in the entire organization. There's always the other way I said, well, you've got a group of people which have experience, which can now help the other bit out. But because we had CHRT, then Bradford, I think we leveraged that people from CHRT could go to Bradford to help with that big bang. Um, so that'll be my bit on that. Laura, as someone who experienced it kind of from the, the clinical side, how would you say that and how, how did it go at Milton Keynes? So we are one one site, so one domain. So that's probably a bit different from uh, Neil's experience in Calderdale as well. Um, so we, we, we've kind of had like a bit of both. So we had that initial Big Bang Go Live where we did all inpatient areas and ED for all clinical documentation, including EPMA, all at the same time except for theatres, ICU and peds. So, and then we had to, to look at doing that later on. And actually, if we had gone live just before the pandemic, our ICU would have had a, a say nicer um, documentation um, mm. because we had to pause our whole, whole go live. But we actually definitely saw the benefits of having uh, integrated EPR where I can see um, notes that have been written or clinical documentation that's been completed anywhere in the hospital even at home if I really want to or even the other side of the world if I'm so minded to look up and need to look up patients record from the other side of the world which I've not had to do yet to be fair um so yeah we've kind of had a, had a bit of both and as, as Neil said there's a lot of camaraderie that goes on during go live it's quite exciting it's, it's really new it's interesting it's it's also a little bit scary because we're basically saying take everything that you've ever done before with all of your clinical documentation and do it a completely different way in a system that you have You've, you've never seen before I mean you've had training on it you we had a we had a play domain which was really really useful we could just log into that and and break things as it were or play with stuff see how the functionality would work see how the workflows would work and then when I'm doing it on a real life patient for real I'm a bit more familiar with it but these things take time it's, it's like when you pass your driving test you 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 learn to drive you pass your driving test and then you truly learn how to drive a car yeah. so that's a bit like that in terms of utilizing an EPR and I sometimes find people were a bit nervous about documenting or completing their their patient's record within the digital space they're they're more inclined to write something on a bit of paper nice and easy but actually you ask them to do something digitally and because it's committed there forever just like it is on paper it just feels a bit different um so yeah just uh, it, it, we've had some very different experiences but they've all been enjoyable and scary all at the same time and i think everyone's more aligned to their own wherever their own trusted yeah. uh, wherever their own organization did because i know that we where i went we were rolling thunder and so i think that's the best way even though <laughs> i can see the benefits and, and pros and cons of, of the mm -hmm. other two options as well yeah. Thanks, Faith. Um, Neil, Karine has asked a little bit about more about your programme with, with students. Um, so I know you went into that a little bit, but is there anything more you can share there or an outline of the programme? Um, what I'll probably do, if I can get her email address, I'll probably say I'd send over uh, Louise Croxall to our CNIO's details. She's, I cannot take much credit, if not anything really, for, for these. She's been the instrumental force behind it, and um, I probably wouldn't do it justice other than what I've probably covered, but I think Louise is more than happy to share the the agenda, the structure, the how we've got them, the areas that we've placed people into. Um, definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll get that and get that sent on if I can get an email address. Really, yeah, that's it. Really perfect. Well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Aji's putting some questions to you, Laura, about the academy, but obviously that's not something you've embarked on yet. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that we can probably answer those questions as they are. Um, but I wondered whether there was anything. I know you've done the the NHS, the, the Digital Academy. Is there anything you want to kind of comment on about without those kind of things here? So I'm actually in process, um, I'm in cohort six of the Digital Health Leadership um, Programme or what we used to be the Digital Academy. And, um, so that's a couple of months in. So yeah, really enjoying that so far. Um, in terms of our um, academy, I've just seen the questions actually. Did you did you integrate the Digital Academy with the current education programme within the organisation? That's a really good question, a really good point actually. I think that's something that we will probably link in with our training team for that. I mean, I, I work quite closely with our, our eCare Southern Millennium training team within the IT space anyway we're always looking at updating our our training that we're delivering and uh, our training team are, are quite uh, responsive to individual needs um, especially within in terms of projects so yeah we'll definitely try and link those those two together. Lovely thanks um, then I kind of guess we've moved on to some um, clinical risk management I don't know if, if Laura you are a, a clinical risk manager uh, I'm not the I'm not the clinical safety officer for the trust, but I have had some training. But um, I work very closely with our clinical safety officer. 
Yeah, so to both of you, do, is that um, it's an integral part of, but is that an integral part of your process when reviewing EPR for yes. workflows? Yeah, yeah, 100%. All of our go lives have a clinical safety case aligned to them, and that is the hazards and risks of A, doing something in the first place, or B, not doing it, um, are very clearly outlined. And we have regular meetings throughout the life of a project, um, often with clinical people, clinical people, clinical members of staff um, who will be using the workflows um, themselves um, to outline that safety case so that we can, I say rubber stamp it. I mean, we need to identify the risks for and against. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely align uh, clinical safety very highly um, uh, with any project that we're doing. Good to hear. Good to hear. Um, Neil, did you want to say anything on that part now? Oh, I can say I'm definitely, I'm fortunate for my sins, I am a CSE, so I've done the clinical safety engineer stuff, I'm very similar to Laura as we do things. And it's it's not just uh, EPR, it's the side systems outside of that that we hold them all to. And the funds of DCB 129s and 160s is a really fun topic and um, one that we probably would not have a separate webinar on either that's had to have any involvement with them um, but no I think we do um, well, we probably put a lot of emphasis on them but we probably do a lot of it behind the scenes um, I think when it comes to the meetings that we probably do from a CHFT perspective we have all of that in, in our minds from a senior leadership team from digital health but what we try to not do is burden people with putting numbers and letters in front of them and saying this is what we need to do similar to a DTAC process what do we do how do we fit DTAC to fit around EPR and all the other bits we need to do and we probably try to make sure that we don't bog the clinical staff down with having to go through these but we make sure we cover off from a hazards perspective that we got that report done they don't necessarily probably see the work to it from from our side because we try to not shield them but make sure we don't stifle them by it um, but we make sure we adhere and can stick to it yeah, great. Lovely. Um, so, uh, Neil, your CNIO, Louise, um, often refers to delivering an EPR as, as delivering a baby, um, or like delivering a baby. There's been a lot of analogies today with our driving and everything. Um, so, you know, you think you've done the hard work when you've done that delivery part, but actually the hard work is just about to start because you've got to raise and nurture and invest in that that EPR to get the best out of it. Um, would you agree with that? And And is there anything that you've done specifically around that? Yeah, do you know what i absolutely agree with the analogy i always come down to either it's epr's like a baby or it's like a house um i think we'll stick with the the baby one today i think yeah. it is it's that you spend nine months 10 months 18 months before that don't you getting ready for that one day and then it happens and everyone says oh that's really fantastic and then now what do we do and then we'll be told you'll stabilize and then you'll optimize and people will put brackets of time against that really we're six years in here we, i would very much say that we probably do have a bit of a six-year-old um it's definitely got a personality of the epr now it definitely knows roughly what it wants um but it definitely needs honing. It definitely needs teaching all the stuff they want to do. It's an analogy that runs beautifully through. Um, and when it gets to 10, it'll then get really uh, problematic and really painful. Uh, but I think it does. I think we know that it's like optimization. It's like learning. Um, no one sat here today would say that they know everything. I think an EPR is exactly the same. We need to keep teaching it different things um, to make it do what we want it to do and to keep investing in it. I think it'd be easy to put something like that live and say, right, well, we're not going to optimize it. We're just going to use it as is. I think we always need to keep going back and challenging it to say, right, can we make things better for our clinical colleagues? Can we improve how they do things? Can we reduce that overall burden? Um can we get the next generation of nurses completely indoctrinated to digital so they just see it as something that they want to do whilst also making sure that those people that do become purely wedded to digital that we also remember how to do the non-digital ways we've still got to be able to do things um should the power go off sort of things i think that's always a bit that we always from an it perspective i think we always need to remember uh, how to do things the old-fashioned way i think sometimes yeah absolutely laura do you agree a hundred percent yeah i think it's really exciting, isn't it? I think I've said that about five times throughout the course of this uh, last 40 minutes. Um, it's really exciting. It's a really exciting journey that we're on to enable our clinical teams to document the delivery of the, the best care with the best system in uh, the best hospital, ideally. If, if you'd said to me 10 years ago, Laura, by the way, you're going to be working in a digitally mature organization that has an EPR I definitely would have laughed at you EPR is not a thing don't be silly that's ridiculous but here we are we're living in the future and we're going to see flying cars next week I, I, there is a long way to go though and as I keep saying we're definitely on a journey and we will be on a journey and we, we can't forget the the thing that is at the center of this which is our patients and that's what we're here for. That's why we come to work in the morning that's why I get up is to deliver care and now I'm able to affect 
not only the patients that are in the hospital now, but patients that will come into the hospital in the future. And I find that the most exciting thing about my job is that I can have an impact on thousands of people's lives. And I think that's really, really cool and really exciting. But we we can't lose sight of that. And as 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 exciting and as fun as the digital is, there's a patient at the end of that. And we are people looking after people. And some of us are patients ourselves. And we we want to receive the best care when we're in hospital. So it's it's just bringing everybody along, including our patients, on on this journey with us, so that we can support them to live healthy, happy, long lives. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So kind of, uh, we've got just less than ten minutes left. So kind of in closing. I guess um thinking about future what's what's kind of next um what plans um do you have to accelerate adoption and engagement just to kind of bring together what we've discussed um I wonder if you could just kind of summarize how um you think that you are maximizing um your investment to your EPR um and I will come to whoever wants to answer that first Laura Neil Neil's come off me too go on, Neil. no it's all right um <laughs> I think we've always got a really good plan um, of what we're going to do for the next 12 months. I think we're looking at, it's probably functionality we're turning on, but looking at pathways as well. So from a CHT perspective, we're going to be finally turning on our estate model content that we've slightly nuanced to make it work how we'd like it to work from a CHT perspective. We know that we've got loads of M pages that we want to try and get live now within there. Um, change facilitators that we've got the training team, they're going to be really instrumental to getting out there, but getting to the ward to do that education, being at the elbow to do that. So taking the learning and the, the bite-sized bits to the staff on the wards, that's going to be the next be- the next biggest thing that we're going to do over the next 12 months from this perspective, as well as just the normal routine maintenance that we know we have to do from an EPR perspective. Um, and it's getting people to understand that that maintenance is something that we know we need to do because it's just as integral now, the EPR probably as the, the people that use it. Um, because without it, it won't function, but we can't function without the nurses and clinical staff either. That's probably our next 12 months rolled out. So from a Milton Keynes perspective, we, we're we quite fortunate here, actually, that we've got a, a exec board that is up for digital and is quite supportive of our digital agenda and the awareness of the importance. Like the IT side of things, the EPR is not just something that exists in the background. It is integral to our workflows now and to our clinicians' day-to-day lives. So that means that we're able to be first of type. So for example, the handheld devices I was talking about earlier, we're the only client running Oracle Health in the UK that has gone live with those so far. Um, that is a journey in itself. And it's a whole mm-hmm. webinar in itself as well. Um, but I think there's definite benefit to that. And moving forward, we aim to optimize uh, some of the functionality within that a little bit more uh, we're also potentially looking at some of our outpatient workflows because we are actually not live with with outpatients uh, we've got some pathway projects that we're we're running at the moment and we've got some uh, some end page workflows um so the modality work uh, pages that we're working through as well within individual uh, departments and also just looking at some of the data that we that we are getting out for our national submissions that we're, we're, we're required to submit. Uh, but there's so much going on all, all of the time. I mean, our, our roadmap is four or five years in advance of things that we have procured that we need to have both Oracle Health resource and uh, clinician resource and IT resource in order to be able to deliver. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, it's, a long, it's an ongoing journey, but we love it. It's very exciting. <laughs> Good. As you said, it's exciting. I think that's the sixth or seventh time. Um, oh, it's very exciting. <laughs> and I think it's, it, it sounds like there's exciting things ahead for, for both Mill Keynes and, and Carlton and Huddersfield. Um, really great to hear from you both today. Thank you both for your time. Um, I hope you found it as enlightening as I have done. Um, and I hope all our, our viewers have as well. So thanks once again, Neil. Thanks once again, Laura. Um, and we will speak to you very soon. Pleasure. Yes, thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.